So today we're having uh, Catherine Whalen, who is the Special Collection Supervisor at the Chavonport Library. And she's going to present on what's new in the Special Collections. Yes. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, so I think many of you guys know me or may have seen me before at different events and things like that. But for those who don't, um, my name is Catherine. Um, and I've been at the library for six years, you guys, this November. Um, so I'm very excited. Um, I It's still a really fun, challenging work environment, and there's so much still left to do. So it's job security to its best. Um, but I am very pleased to be with you today to speak to you about what's new in special collections and kind of review um, what has happened in 2023 and then highlighting some changes that are coming in the future. I have to click my book. Okay. Uh, so this year we have seen a number of really great things happen um, in special collections that have um, brought in visitors, but also making our stuff more accessible, which that's a little bit later in the slides. But um, just to highlight some things that have been going on from this January to September, um, I was really hoping I could get through the end of like September. Some of these stats aren't 100% correct because I did them a week ago. Um, but we had about 1,000, one, or 1,619 visitors in special collections. Um, we keep daily stats. So if you guys are volunteers, um, you're marking down and writing who's visiting us. So this helps us keep track of this number. Um, and then on our social media, we have 669 followers on Facebook. Um, Instagram, we have 1,234 um, followers. So or likes, so that's great. Um, social media for our e-newsletter, so we have a total of 673 um, subscribers to that newsletter that goes out quarterly, and actually there's going to be a change with that too. Uh, but um, our access to our various sites, archive and manuscript catalog, we've seen 13,534 um, views of our archive and manuscript catalog. So that's um, the catalog that is used to access our archival materials, manuscripts, things that are not books. Um, so we're thrilled about that number. And then um, views to our Upper Mississippi Valley Digital Image Archive have been about 10,600. Um, and then we also have a secondary page that houses the materials that we received an HRDP grant for. Um, and so that was, that wrapped up last year, I believe. Um, and so that's uh, audio visual materials from that collection. So um, the reel to reels, the VHS, the CDs, things like that. Um, and that's, those technically are owned by the Bix Museum but we make them accessible. And so those have only gotten 266, but there's a caveat to that is because whereas most of the stuff you guys can access at home from your own computers, this collection here, you have to access inside the library to listen to it. Just because of copyright restrictions, we wanted to make sure that we're trying to follow all the laws and only make it accessible inside. Um, and then also, we've received over 75 um, material donations. So that's books, photographs, archival materials, um, maps, all gamuts of stuff. Anything that you guys donate to us that's a physical object, we keep track of. And so we've received a good, good number of those. Um, and so that's been really exciting. And then, um, so we also have another change in our hours. So I feel like each year I've been giving this since like 2019, I've been telling you guys that we've had new hours. So, <laughs> but um, 
So if you guys don't know, or if you're unfamiliar with our hours, so we're open Mondays from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then Tuesday through Friday, we're open 9 to 5. And so unlike the rest of the library, which is open until 5.30, at least at Maine. Um, and then Saturdays, we're open um, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then closed over that lunch period and then opening back up on at one to five. And then there's an additional um, information about that is that we're only open the first Saturday of every month. And so if you guys would like to see us, make sure that you don't come on those other Saturdays because then we'll be closed. Uh, but Katie or myself will be upstairs, but we won't have access to our space. So we can help you with any digital stuff or like that type of material or requests, but we won't be able to access any of our materials. Uh, and then Sunday we're closed. So that only one big change was the reduction of our Saturday hours. Then um, one really excellent offering that we've been able to implement this year is to have displays at each of our um, library branches of special collections materials. So we have a total of four exhibits, one at Eastern, one at Fairmount, and then two at Maine. So one on the first floor and then one in special collections. And so the one at Eastern, if you guys walk in the front door, it's all the way to the back wall. So it's right there with two poster holders around it. And then if you go to Fairmount, you'll see the like little eating nook. You'll go down that hallway um, to our meeting spaces at Fairmount and then it's there. And then um, the one at Maine on the first floor is going to be right, right around the corner when you walk into the library. So, um, but there's reasons why we did that because there are glass cases and we just didn't want someone to accidentally bump into them and then knock them over. <laughs> um, so, but we really were pleased to offer this and get them get our materials out into a different space so people can kind of learn more about us and learn more about what our collection has in store. And so the displays kind of cover the topics of our Upper Mississippi Valley Digital Image Archive um, and, and our digitization process at in special collections. So I took pictures of Christina scanning images. So one of my staff members, I stood there and took pictures of her and she's like, what are you doing to me? <laughs> but that's good. <laughs> she was a team sport. Um, and then we had our other displays. So all of these kind of were inspired by the recent research guides that we've made um, and handouts about our various collections and how to use them. So we made one about a bookmark about UMBDIA. Um, and then we had one on how to research your home or building. And so we pulled materials that we highlighted in that brochure. And so kind of see, give you a visual of what can you, what types of materials you can use for those types of research, um, architectural drawings, and then school records. So it's been really kind of fun to kind of shape those. And we try to, um, with these displays, we also wanted to keep in mind since we don't always get to keep the materials out of the sunlight or in best the best conditions because um, they're going to be essentially rotating for the whole year. So we try and make um, scans or replicas of the most rare stuff and then use duplicates for books and things like that. So, um, But in special collections, we kind of have a little bit more space. So then once they get back here, then we can add some more stuff into them. So it's a little bit more special down in special collections, of course. Um, and then we also were able to feature for like two or three months, a really great display on um, Irish heritage and materials from the St. Patrick Society who does the um, St. Patrick's Day Parade. And so they give us posters now annually and then let us display some of their materials. So it's it's been fun. Um, so that's the picture there. And then along with um, the display case to house the materials, 
we've been creating posters that kind of allow us to add even a little bit more context or like description to the materials as well. And then that's just another example. So that's Christina getting her pictures taken of her hands. And she's a hand model in that one. And then our Sanborn fire insurance maps too. So she did a really great job with those ones. But um, so some new items in our collection. So we have, um, I asked Katie to kind of pull some books and take pictures of them for me. Um, so we got, we've received a number of donations and or purchases um, that we thought you guys would be interested in. So we got this um, Iowa Stories. It's a, a textbook that we received a donation. It was one in a series. And I think we had book two and maybe another one, but we didn't have this book one. And then um, the book in the middle, the West Side Kids in a Pocket Full of Wishes um, is a book by a local author. It's a fiction um, title. And unfortunately, David Doris is no longer with us. He passed away this year. Um, so, but we, we try and keep some local materials in our collection, local fiction, lo local authors. Of course, everything's pretty much local in our collection. So it's hard to separate, but um, we do try and keep up with modern um, fiction writers. And then um, as a side note, the Fairmount Library has um, dedicated some space to an actual local author collection that will circulate. And so this will, this has no barrier of like genre. So it's essentially any material written by an, a local author. And they have parameters of the person either being born in Scott when, or Rock Island County or currently living here, I believe. So um, so their parameters are a little bit different than ours. Um, and then we have just a general uh, genealogy on the family history. And then, um, so all of these books, there's a caveat, they'll be found in our library's catalog with all the other materials. They'll say that they'll be um available in uh special collections and so we got a interesting donation of um like pamphlets from the amazon uh, pickle and vinegar works um and so they sold authentic patterns from the past at one time and so we got a cute um, handout from that and then i've been trying to collect just all the premium lists from the mississippi valley fair an exposition. Um, so each year they publish um, a book and they all the goings on at the fair and all the listings of the animals and things like that. So I've been trying to purchase that to keep our collection up to date and co uh, comprehensive with those types of local materials. And then um, this is actually, I think, the third copy of the seven L's that we've received. So these uh, children um, lived at Annie Witt. And so one of them wrote a diary about her time and tried to document her life at Annie Witt and Myers Orphan's Home. And so she um, has been really grateful, gracious in donating a manuscript when she first had written it up in a paper format. And then she, I think she had it just like staple bound and now she kind of got it officially bound and so she's she's been keeping us up to date with all any any of the updates that she's been giving us and then we also got another kind of biographical book um from byron bk davis he is the first african-american um steinway pianist international pianist from davenport and he's lives part-time in burlington iowa and then down in florida but he's played all over the world. And he just re recently spoke at our Eastern branch about his life. So those are some new books. They should all be in the catalog. If they're not, I'm sure Katie's working on getting them processed, um, especially now that she's told you guys all about them. But this collection I know has not been cataloged yet. Um, so we recently got a donation of genealogical 
text and books um, from a local person. And so that's kind of just a compilation of types of materials that um, we try and add into our collection so that we can get a more holistic look at our collection. And then if we do, say if you donate things that we already have in our collection that are Davenport related or genealogy, like general basic stuff, we do try and supplement the circulating collection with those donations too. So not, not that they'll not be in our collection and special collections, but they might be able to circulate upstairs. So we're really happy about that. So then we don't have to just send everything to the friends or just gigs. Um, and then, and then we can also offer things that, you know, might be better used at home because I know not everything like how to genealogy stuff is the best down in special collections. Um, and then, oh, and then about new books. So how often do you guys all use our catalog to search for books? Okay. Have you noticed something different about it? So um, the beginning of this year, or I don't remember when, it was sometime. Um, it all blurred together. There's been so many changes. Um, but we implemented um, a new overlay of our catalog called Vega. And so when you initially go in to our library catalog, it'll look a little bit different than it did previously. And so there's better ways to search it now, but you can still use a classic catalog. So if you see up in the top bar, I'll bring it up really quick for you guys, just so you can see it, if I can. I just want to pull you down. Stop doing that. It keeps popping up and telling me that I need to do stuff. Don't, I don't want to do that. Okay. Ha ha. And I'll just be super tiny. I'll be fine. Okay. But if you go to Davenport Library, then you can search by anything. Um, I'll just say Davenport. Um, and you can search. And so this is the new overlay of Vega. And so it looks very similar, but it's kind of different. Um, and you can see that it, Davenport's pulled back a lot of um, different materials um, and its results. But you can see it's supposed to like group a title that has multiple formats, like a movie or a book or a CD or something like that, all in this um, column right here under serial. Um, special collections is different just because most of our stuff doesn't come in multiple formats, um, but you can view locations, things like that, um, that type of information. But one of the things that if you guys are searching for special collections materials over on the side, you can now uh, narrow down your searches by special collections, which when we first impl implemented Vega, we could not do that. And so you could really, it was a really hard time trying to search for any materials in special collections because how I showed you guys all with like the set search options on the old way, where you can set to Davenport, Maine, and then down to special collections, and it's just our specific stuff. Um, but now you can do that a little bit more, but you'll still have access to cla the classic catalog. And I know that Rivershare as a whole is going to try, so that's the Bettendorf Public Library, Scott County Library System, um, I think Musser and Clinton, um, there's a number of libraries on the Iowa side that have adopted this. So I think they're all going to try and implement this starting January 1 and make this be their primary um, catalog. But I think we'll still have access to um, the old one, but the classic catalog, which I hope so because 
we have tons of notes in our catalog records, like specific things like about donors, about different copies that you can't necessarily see in that new catalog. Um, but then we can hop into new collections. So um, new collections that we've received this year, I asked Karen to kind of go through and pick out a few that um, might be of interest to the genealogist or family historian. And so this one, is a donation that we received in 2023-01. So this was the first one that we at least got to around accessioning. Um, and so this is the Mini M Framing Papers. And so this collection is made up of two series. So that's two um, organizational sets of information. Um, and it contains six five-year diaries. Um, kept by many from 1931 to 1945. And then she had a, a brief gap in there. Um, and then she started a backup in 1962 to 1975, in which she documents family events, daily activities, and the weather. Um, the donors um, actually did a really great job of trying to go through each of the diaries and make some additional notes and highlight certain events and dates. So with little sticky notes, they let us know, hey, this page has interesting tidbits, um, which we try to remove the sticky notes from the actual page and then just make note of those so that people can go back. So don't put sticky notes on, or don't put tape on them at least um, to keep them stuck in place. And then the other part of the collection, so that other series is, a collection that includes mostly annotated recipe files um, maintained by Minnie and her sister, sister Edna Sh uh, Schick, uh, most of which are handwritten. So a little detail about Minnie. Um, she was born on February 22nd of 1893 to John and Minnie um, Schick. Uh, Minnie's, her mom's last name was Poole, uh, Cole. She married Ferdinand Ferry, J. Ferdinand, um, in July of 1916. They had no children. He died in 1933. Minnie had several siblings, one of which was her older sister, Edna, whom she spent a lot of time with. The Schick family were longtime citizens in Davenport, owning the Schick Express and Transfer. A number of family members served their, served their communities in law enforcement. Uh, Minnie's husband, Ferdinand, was associated with A.P. Griggs in the piano business and later operated the Taxico filling station at the corner, southeast corner of Fourth and Games. Minnie died in 1985. Her obituary states that she was a lifelong member of Chapter 178, Order of Eastern Star, a 50-year member of the Order of the White Shrine of Jerusalem, and a member of daughter of Mo, Mokana, um, Mohansen Cauldron II. And so these are just samples of one of her, her diaries. So they're really fun. And they all have keys with them. They kept She kept the keys with them too. And so if they ever accidentally get locked, we can we don't have to break the, the diary. Yeah. So did you say you, you have some kind of an outline of highlights of what's been I've kept the, I tried to keep the sticky notes inside the, the diaries individually. I don't know if Karen's transcribed them in any, like, on archive space or not, but we can look at it. Okay. Yeah, the, the, no, the, the notes are in there, so you can. Yeah. Um, so this collection um, was our 2020-20. 2023-20. Um, this is a donation um, of Dr. Charles H. Preston papers. And so unfortunately, I don't know who the donor is. They just dropped this baggie of stuff off in the Dropbox, and then we received it in special collections. So if you guys are a donor to some place, write your name on the materials because I want to thank you and or send you a deed of gift so that we know who gave us the donation. Um, 
but this is really interesting um, because this collection covers the years of 1873 to 1897. It's a collection that consists of handwritten phys uh, physician records of birth and death in Scott County, Iowa. There are also, uh, also individual medical notes pertaining to many of the patients the doctor attended over his, the years he was practicing and the books are indexed. So it's really awesome. Mm -hmm. um, he was from Davenport. Yeah. Um, they're like little like booklets that are um i i didn't get to i didn't have enough space to keep all the images but they're all like little booklets that open up they're not too big they're like this big no it's multiple it's per year it's like years of so each person he would write down and so then he would then submit that, I think, that information to the state or the county level. And then, so these are his personal, like, records. Um, the first book has handwritten notes from schools and symposiums in New York attended by Dr. Preston in the spring of 1873 after his graduation from the University of Iowa. Um, the second contains the death certificate stubs that began in 1880 in Iowa, as well as a list of patients he attended after his graduation in 1873. Um, the stubs are filled out. Most of, Some of the stubs have medical notes pertaining to the disease regarding his diagnosis, treatment plan, burial, in place of burial. In some instances, the place of burial is listed as home, because he probably just didn't know. Um, and then the book cover, this book covers 1873 to 1897. The final two books contain uh, returns of birth and stillbirths that began in 1880 in Iowa and the list of births he attended after his graduation in 1873. So he tried to keep track of all that fun stuff. I didn't write down the extents, but it's close to that. It's like four, maybe five. Yeah, um, probably four, just because of the numbering. Um, the stubs are filled out, and in many cases, there are medical notes pertaining to the mother and the child regarding any complications of the pregnancy, delivery, or birth, medications provided during labor, time and delivery, uh, time of delivery and after birth, and then sex, weight of the child, birth order of the child, and then information on the parents. These medical notes would be of special interest to anyone researching 19th century medical care or individuals born in this area, born or have died in this area. Um, Dr. Charles Preston was born to Dr. Charles H. and Susanna Hinklin Preston of Stark County, Ohio in 1844. His family moved to Oskaluska, um, Iowa in 1865. Preston attended the State University at Iowa City, um, obtaining his medical degree in 1873. He married, he opened a successful practice in Davenport and was very active in civic matters. Um, in 1887, he married a Ruth Irish um, and they raised three children. After many years of service, Dr. Preston died in 1914. So, I'm not sure. Then, um, this is a collection that we received um, about uh, 2023 16, the Sheridan Hustlers 4 H Club Collection. So, this is all about the Sheridan Hustlers, one of the um, groups of 4 H students um, in the area from the townships of Sheridan. And so this collection dates from 1928 to 1974. Junior and senior club, it includes junior and senior club records, bo record books, photographs, negatives, secretary books are generally arranged as follows. Club membership, clippings, programs, pictures, 
and miscellaneous story ribbons, secretary books. Um, it also has Kathy Fowler's members records book as well. As well. And so um, this group actually, we have the records dating from its founding in 1928. So that's really great. And these are just examples of kind of the materials that are found within the collection. Um, lots of fun photos of all the activities that the, the students participated in. Um, some more modern photos too, so that's really fun. Um, lots of group shots. They did a lot of picnics and outdoor activities along with um, just learning about everything 4-H. And then they showed off their, their activities of what they did. Um, not too much, um, but some of them are on the back. Um, and so this is another donation that we received. It's 2023-2022. 2020, er, um, this is the Kelly Lantry Family History Collection. Um, this donation um, covers the years of eight, 1988, or 1998 to 2021. The collection is divided into five basic um, series. So the donors database about the Kelly Lantry family, um, the Kelly historical, Kelly history and, from Michael J. Lawrence, that's from 1998, uh, Barnaby Lantry branch lines by a Gail C. F. Randolph um, from 2023, uh, or 20, 2003. Um, and then the Lantry family tree um, by Gail again, and then a Lantry or Lang tree family database by a Lois Lang tree Steffi in 2005. So these are just some examples, a lot, some of it's copies, some of it's um, typed out notes, some of it's handwritten notes. So you can look through those if you have those family names in your, in your line. Yeah. They should be Davenport or adjacent. Um, then we have a donation that um, has lots of fun stuff in it. Um, so these, this collection dates from 1910 to 1970. Um, it contains a large number of photographs of the Crescent Macaroni and crack, Cracker family uh, factory and items pertaining to the Davis family who lived here in Davenport, Iowa. The items of, per, of particular interest are the Radio KSTT Top 30 Survey from uh, July, July 8th to the 14th in, in 1960. So you can see kind of this fun uh, pamphlet um, that was... <laughs> Um, and then an annual report by uh, uh, WOC TV sponsored by Junior Achievement Company um, from the early 60s. And then a small collection from the Sears Company. And so the, the daughter um, donated her father's collection, Al Davis's. Um, he worked at the Crescent Macaroni Company. And so um, he he saved all this stuff and then she saved it all and she wanted it to go um, someplace um, that would take care of it. And he worked at the Crescent Macaroni factory for many years as a maintenance worker and obtained many of the items from the Crescent office. And so that's where a lot of these photos and things came from. No, not, not that I, not that was in the, um, uh, archive space record. Oh, yeah. um, huh? This is looking to be because um, this friend of mine and I, we actually own the Crescent Macaroni for a while. Oh. And we actually had several conversations around it. Oh. Oh, I'll we'll have to pick your brain. And we get paper and things that we don't I don't know even if it's no He's no longer living. Um, his daughter is about your age or around your age. So he's, he was an older gentleman. Yeah. I would say that he's no longer living. 
just from the sounds of yeah. our communications with her. Um, but one thing that was really interesting is this uh, up in the corner. It's a uh, lessons in loveliness that was a set of classes that young ladies could take at Peterson's um, <laughs> store. And so they could learn how to be all level. Um, and so she attended that in the 60s. Um, so that was really fun. But then we also have an accrual. So an accrual is, so when you donate a collection and it's pretty much the same materials or if like, say if I had a collection of my personal papers, so that can include my diary, um, materials that I've worked on, things like that. And I donate more of that type of or similar type of material um, that will go into the same accession, but it will be an accrual. So it'll be accessioned as a new donation for that current year, but it will go into an existing collection. And so that's kind of what happened with this. Um, so this donation was originally began in 2016 and it was the 46th of that year. Um, this is actually from the Schmidt family who um, operated the Crescent Macaroni and Cracker Company. And so they donated a number of really interesting things this year. Um, they donated videos uh, that they took of their workers and they have them all digitized. Um, and then we get the original and then also the camera that they took it on. Um, family materials. And then these really fun examples. So like tons of cute little like promotional materials. But okay, so most archives do not want to accept food into their collection. It's a problem for pests. It's a problem for mold, all that sorts of stuff. But when we receive fried macaroni that's preserved for all time, um, and also we have crackers, um <laughs> that are also super hard you would break a tooth eating them but we're super thrilled so we have examples of the packaging and then the actual materials that they made as well and then we got um from this collection and then from al davis's collection we also got cookie presses things like that that they used um at the factory so it's a really special like combination of collections then, um, oh yes, please do, please do. Um, we'll have a new collection under your name. So um, then this next collection, this was 2023-42. It's a collection of albums from St. Luke's School of Nursing. Um, it actually dates from 1951 to 1954. It's a collection that's made up of two photograph albums featuring the uh, St. Luke's nursing class of 1954. This is primarily made up of unidentified photographs, um, unfortunately. Um, the albums also contain a few newspaper clippings. There are no specific identification in either album as to the other than dates. Um, the album contains color snapshots that were scanned as prints and some are badly yellowed. And then um, there are some black, there are a lot of black and white uh, snapshots as well. 21 names that have been entered into the class and then uh, 20 names attending the capping ceremony can be gleaned from the clippings. And we have those listed in the um, archive space record. Um, but really fun stuff like shows the girls in their dormitories and their rooms um, studying and doing various activities, having fun, um, doing parades and things like that. Um, and then they get a hold of a whole bunch of babies and then have a whole bunch of activities and some social hours. So it looks like this girl's going to get her hair cut, which is slightly scary, <laughs> um, but she must trust them. Um, but yeah, so this is another really fun collection of memorabilia. And then um, this is a, one of the last collections that I'll talk about um, is 2023-51, the straight collection. So this is uh, 
collection of materials that the donor collected about primarily um, dating from 1974 or 47 to 1966. And it includes ephemeral items from St. John's Methodist Church here in Davenport. Um, the church um, is located on Brady and 14th Street. Um, so it shows a Christmas pageant, tidings newsletter, golden anniversary yearbook membership. So it's a really good one if you know that your ancestor was a Methodist and you think that you want to just double check the years of um, attendance, you can check that out and find out a little bit more history about the church as well as the people who attended there. Then, okay. yeah, so that was 1947 to 1966. So we do collect like really minor things like that. And then we also had a donor who donated uh, eighth grade graduation from a rural school. And then she was like, oh, I also have the birth, like baptismal record for her too, the original document, but I gave it to the church because I didn't know if you would want it. And I was like, oh, we would actually like that. Um, so if they ever don't want to keep it or if they don't know what to do with it, they can always donate it to us. And we ended up getting it. So we have two items. It was a Pleasant, the Pleasant Valley, I want to say Baptist, but I don't think it is. Um, it's out rural, like Betzendorfy, Pleasant Valley area. Um, but yeah, so if you guys have stuff like that, or if you know people that have things like that, we would love it. Um, are the collections accessible? Through archives, our archive and manuscript catalog. And so they're at various processing levels depending on the size. Um, so some of the collections are super large. Some of them are just one or two items. Um, so it just depends on our staff time and things like that. Um, but coming, we did tons of programs this year. Um, so we have a sampling of things that we've done. So we did a preservation workshop talking about the disaster, disaster planning for the archive. So what to do with if we have water or fire or flooding or typical things. Most of the time it boils down to water, fire, heat, other things like that, like just exposure to like mold, damage to items. Because if you have a fire, you also have to deal with water and mold. And so just trying to be as prepared as possible. Um, and then we had Delia Rainey come and talk and give two um, workshops on writing creative family history and then also writing a creative memoir about yourself as well. Um, and those are going to be on YouTube. Um, so if you missed the program, which we obviously did, um, but you can check those out. And then we've been doing an ongoing series with the Rock Island Arsenal uh, Army Sustainment Command Office. Um, and so they've been talking about uh, Vietnam and Korea this year. And I believe they're going to be talking about the Civil War and then some other topics. But Special Collections is not going to be leading that program anymore. It's passing that on to Information Services, so our reference department. So it'll still be at the same location, same general day and time, um, but you just won't see a Special Collections person there, unless it's a super local uh, presentation. Are you pleased with all those? We used to. When, when we were here, it was way easier because I had the setup. I kind of chickened out over at Eastern because I just didn't and our people talk our people walked around a lot and so I didn't want to like try and finagle with their voices caring and so um so we didn't and they were recording it for us after the fact but they've been pretty bad about getting us the recording so I just have kind of cut our losses um, not that everyone's busy, so it's just hard. Um, but they tend to try and repeat programs every once in a while. So, um, 
but then we did do a fun um, getting you out of your house and even out of the library, uh, the QC history hop. And so um, this year I tried to schedule them just for the months of June, July, and August. So summer months where it's nice. Um, and then a time to go visit other fun places like we got Belgian waffles from the Center for Belgian Cultural Culture on their first Saturday where they offer a Belgian uh, waffle breakfast. And then we got a tour of their space where they collect and have a little museum. Lots of great resources for a genealogist over there if you have Belgian ancestry um, and tons of great folks to work with over there. Um, then we got to go visit the Halberg Museum at the, in, at the Black Hawk State Historic Site. It was on one of the hottest days, unfortunately, and we were planning on walking a little bit through the, the park, which we decided not to. And so we got a kind of virtual tour and then got to walk through the museum as well. And then we were going to go visit the Bix Museum, but unfortunately they've been having struggles. So if you guys love Bix and want to preserve that, help them out because they're, they're struggling. Um, and then we also have been doing the Heart of Downtown Davenport Architectural Styles and Stories um, uh, program that started in June. And then we had one in July, August, September, and then we have our last one coming up in October. So. It's a really fun tour. We get to talk about all the different architecture, not necessarily the history, some of it's local history related, but most of it's focused on the architectural styles and the times and the buildings that we're talking about. And then um, we were working with the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum Foundation to offer virtual access to their third Thursday programs. So this will still go on, um, we're actually, these should all be recorded on YouTube um, under the third, uh, under Hoover's Presidential Foundation. Um, it's on a variety of topics. Mostly it's something related to Herbert Hoover and his museum and the collections that they have there. Um, but we will no longer be um, offering a link directly from our library, but you can still go and watch it for free. Um, it was a little convoluted and I don't think there was too, I think there was too many hands in the pot, but that is okay. Um, but it's a really great program. They offer some really fun stuff. Um, and then this last February, we did a presentation on John Adonassoff, um, who was the first person to kind of think of the concept and then build a model of a digital computer. So. Um, he was a professor at Iowa State University um, in Ames. And so then he came over with his mind all clouded and he sat someplace, possibly a bar um, in Rock Island. And then he um, wrote down the, the beginnings of a, a computer and then he went back and made it. And so he was a part of a trial and... Um, that proved that he he came up with a first digital computer. And so we watched a documentary that was made about him and then had three panelists come talk. And we partnered um, on this program with Augustana College and then the Rock Island Public Library. It was a really fun event. Then um, just recently, Katie worked with some folks who worked as farm laborers in Pleasant Valley working at the onion fields. Um, the dates range from 1940s to 1960s, so they talked um, about their experiences there, as well as had we had some farmers or people who owned the land um, and who could share that experience too in the audience. But this uh, program has been recorded and it's on our YouTube page, so you can come watch that. And then um, we had a volunteer or an intern, I guess, um, Harris and Phyllis come and talk about researching local musicians in the Quad Cities called Beyond Fix. And so he did that on September 25th and that's also been recorded. And I think I had to get it up on YouTube. So it will be up on YouTube shortly, um, <laughs> but it's just got uh, edited. Um, so that's a, another fun, really local 
programming topic that we did. And then um, typically the first week of February, we have what we celebrate in special collections. And then also it's a global sensation now is color our collection. So we make a coloring book with um, pages that are from our resources in special collections. And so this last year, we just made a booklet and a little baggie with like crayons and a fun little kit that you can take home. And it was available at each branch, just getting folks, adults and children, people of all ages, um, interested in our collections and in a different way. And then some other programs that we have. Oh, my photo isn't. There was a photo right there. Uh, it's weird. Um, so uh, this is some partner programs that we've done with SCIGS. So you guys. Um, so some stuff that we've covered this year is dying to discover records at the Scott County Courthouse with Sharp Levins, um, the Iowa Gen Web project with Glenn McCleary, and then a bring and share with Mike Thomas. So um, some really fun programming to celebrate um, Skiggs's 50th anniversary this year. Um, and then uh, we, I got to work with Ann Thomas on offering um, crash course in genealogy. We offered three different sessions. So one at our Eastern branch, one at Maine, and then one at Fairmount. And so we just wrapped that up actually this last Thursday. Um, and we've had, we had pretty good turnout for each one. So we had people at each one. So we got to reach new folks who were interested in genealogy. And then I think that corner one was going to be talking about Ricky King, who we had in, um, in September. I couldn't find a cute one like this. So I had to like use a different graphic, which is fine. Um, and then special collections on top of everything else that we did this year, we also do outreach. And so um, I presented to Allen County Public Library. So uh, the famous Fort Wayne um, Genealogical Library um, about the Richardson Sloan Special Collection Center and our resources. And then I did pretty much the same talk to the Iowa City Genealogical Society um, this summer in June. Um, so that was really fun. I got to do the Allen County one virtually. I did not travel to Fort Wayne, but I did travel to Iowa City. Um, and then uh, we got to work with St. Ambrose University. Um, I attended the Art and Museum Studies Career Fair with our outreach supervisor, as well as I attended a Museum Studies class this week. I talked about my professional career and how I got to where I was. Um, and then we've attended the party in the parks and we've typically tried to do this the last couple years in conjunction with um, the Historic Preservation Commission of the city of Davenport. And so this is just to bring awareness of the resources that we have about preserving local history, especially our built environment, as well as what they can offer with the resources of funding and also getting if you live in a historic home, that approval for taking care of your historic home. Um, then Amy Driscoll got to talk at Fairmount Cemetery about Helen Van Dale. And then I got to take talk about her just on Friday uh, at the Naham Marsh Breakfast Club. So um, a couple of you guys attended. Um, so that was really fun um, ways to share what resources and research that we've done in our collection. Um, so some upcoming programs and uh, events. Um, we have the Quad City Archives Fair that is Saturday, October 28th, 2023 at the Halberg Estate. It's from 1 to 4 p.m. It's free and open to the public. Um, Minda Powers Douglas will be talking about translating tombstones. So if you guys are interested, she'll be talking about that twice um, at different at 1.30 and then at 3. So come on over. Um, it's a beautiful home um, built by Susanna Dinkman. Um, her family was a part of the Dinkman Weyerhaeuser uh, Lumber Company over in Rock Island. And so they amassed a lot of wealth. And so the home is very beautiful. So come check that out. And then another time to steer. 
Um, this was written by Bill Mueller. He is going to be talking about um, humorous tales of family history and farm life, um, mostly from the DeWitt area, um, but he'll be here on Monday, October 16th. And then I don't know about my present. I'm going to try it again. Okay, what size? 29. I'm going to try refreshing it, you guys. I think that is the walking tour, but I don't want to steer you on the wrong spot. So um, then we have one last Heart of Downtown Davenport walking tour that's going to be on Saturday, October 21st at 10 a.m. So if you haven't done it, please sign up. It's a really great time. Um, really fun to look at all the interesting old buildings that we have downtown. And then we have some other upcoming programs, Peeling Back the Layers, What Lurks Beneath the Service Surface. Um, very mysterious title, but it is about the um, <laughs> ground penetrating radar um, that had occurred at City uh, Cemetery in Davenport over on Rockingham. And so um, the gentleman, Chad Goings, who did the survey, he's going to be coming and talking about his findings, how to kind of go about that process and that stuff. So if you're interested, come to that. And then um, Katie Reinhardt, our special collections librarian, will be um, opening the box on the Davenport Museum of Art collection. So um, we received this donation back, I don't know, 90s, 2000s, 2000s maybe, um, from the city of Davenport. So this is materials that the city of Davenport, um, it's met its retention schedule and so it came to us. So that's November 17th. And then we have one last program for the year, which is SCIGS, which is the December program. That's going to be um, trying to solve a brick wall with DNA research, and it's going to be a case study. So come and visit that too. So we really don't, we have a bulk of programs in October and then nothing else after. <laughs> Two programs. Um, so some digital collections that we have, um, I'm just going to say that we'll, we're going to be in the process of digitizing a lot of our photographic materials. Um, and then I'm going to try and work on getting some of our textual materials digitized too. Um, and so that will be something that's coming in the future. Um, but the next few months, we're going to focus on trying to get some of our digital or photographic materials digitized. And so over the next year, we'll be trying to upload those to the Upper Mississippi Valley. So there'll be new stuff on there for you. And then um, we're going to introduce formally, which I've been hinting at this for the last few times that I talked to you guys. Um, but as you may have noticed, um, if you've used our local database search, it is no longer there. Um, so this is our new, um, essentially, database that will um, has the same information on there. So special collections indexes. And so it's at this new URL, blogs.davenportlibrary.com slash digital. Um, so it has really great stuff. I will show you. So this is what the site looks like. Um, it has some just general information. There's a little blog introducing um, and saying why we changed it and that type of stuff. But there's about us, um, about the, the indexes that we created, and then um, some search tips down there. But like the um, local database search, um, it was a federated search that searched across all the databases or the indexes. Um, you can search across all the indexes here by first name, last name, year, and keyword. You can only enter in one keyword, but it can be hyphenated if you want. Um, but then in addition to just searching across all of them, if you know of a specific collection or index that you want to search, 
you can go to the specific category and search that specific index. So it should, um, it's really nice if you guys want a tutorial at all, um, we can show you that in special collections. Um, an additional thing that we've added to this is our Iowa Patents and Inventors Index. So that's not something that we we maintain in special collections, but um, we are a patent and trademark center, resource center for the state of Iowa. We're uh, the second one um, now, or well, we were the first and now there's the second. Um, and so you can search that and see all the local Iowa inventors. Back to that address again. Yeah, it's just blogs.davenportlibrary.com slash digital. So yeah, if you guys are interested in learning more about that, just come over and we can show you how to do that. Um, then we have some really fun social media stuff. We have, um, we continue to do Throwback Thursday on Facebook. Um, we have a thing that we call, or that the National Archives is calling hashtag um, archives party. And so they have different themes. And so this one was archive baby. So pictures of baby. <laughs> Christina got a big food out of that. Um, and then we have our newsletter um, and then our, our blog that we write weekly um, blogs, posts on. And so different, various different um, collections that we talk about there. So some news coming from special collections. Um, so we were just awarded another HRDP grant to digitize the Fred Low Recording Studio uh, collection of music. So they, unlike the Bix collection, which not a lot of that was super local, but it was about Bix who was local. Um, this collection is hyper local. Um, they had a studio over in Moline, and then they had, um, they bought a house over in the village of East Davenport, and they recorded there for a number of years. And so um, they have fun advertisements in the newspapers, like you can record your wedding, um, you could do an advertisement, tons of fun stuff, do a special like thing for your dad for Father's Day. Um, one of the recent things that we learned about was this lady, her husband must have been in the service. And so she went to the Fred Lowe Studios and dictated her letter and sent him a recording of her letter. And so it was really sweet and like fun. Um, something only like local historians um, would love. Um, but we got that. And so the first box is actually being digitized as we speak. And so there's three total boxes, but we're getting materials all the time because they're they were prolific in recording. Um, and there's several great articles in the Quad City Time or the, the de local uh, Davenport papers about Fred and Lois Mock. Um, and so that will be a really fun collection to offer. But unfortunately, um, You'll have to come to the desk and like get a flash drive with the materials and then plug it into a computer and then listen to it that way just because it's all still mostly in copyright. Um, so it was a really troublesome time of trying to track down because there's ensembles, there's um, groups of musicians, individuals. So it would have been a total bear of a project to try and track down everybody who was represented and see if they were okay with us digitizing it and making it, it available. And then we have some other changes in special collections coming. Um, so I mentioned some elusively uh, uh, about the newsletter. So unfortunately we're going to be stopping our quarterly newspaper or newsletters um, just because it was taking a lot of staff time and I don't, it was just something that we could cut. Um, unfortunately, hopefully we can someday bring it back, but um, not that our news and information won't get out there. We have our blog, we have social media, 
Um, and then we also have um, the libraries continuing to send out news about programs and things like that, but um, which will be included, but it was just something that we could um, unfortunately have to kind of cut. Um, and then we do have exciting news. So um, next year, sometime, I don't know when, um, we may be starting a project to move um, our service area for special collections up to the second floor. And so it's hard to explain. So we'll be closing down the basement level of special collections and then making, a, for all intents and purposes, a reading room type space upstairs on the second floor. And so we'll be expanding technically our space um, by keeping core collections upstairs We'll keep majority of our local Scott County Davenport materials upstairs, as well as um, some key genealogy resources like Germans from America, things like that, just depending on space. Um, we'll have access to microfilm readers, um, Scott County vital records on microfilm, uh, at least one map case, and then some reading room light tables to do research with archival collections and things like that. But downstairs will be a traditional kind of closed stack environment where patrons cannot just go and visit. We'll have to have um, staff members go and fetch materials that are not located on the second floor. Um, but hopefully that will allow us to kind of grow a little bit more too, just because we have been receiving a number of donations. And so it will be nice to kind of expand um, the space where we can store those. But but it will be a big change, lots of different service model changes and things like that. And um, so we appreciate your guys' patience while that happens. We might have to be closed while we're moving stuff. I'm not 100% sure on how all the details will work because we're still in the planning stages. Um, but um, if you have any questions about that, I can answer that after um, or af after I get done. Um, but those are our big changes. Um, so that might impact our hours. We might be able to expand them a little bit more just based on our location and things like that. Um, but we'll see. We'll, we'll take it all in stride and we'll help, help manage the change for you guys as well as for us. But do you guys have any questions? We should expand and say the, the plans are on the second floor on the south side, it's going to be blast off. Oh, mm -hmm. And then um Yeah, the plan, yeah. The plan is so essentially if you guys are familiar with the second floor, there's a row of columns that are um along that mezzanine area in the center. Um there's going to be glass wall that's not going to be completely frosted, but it'll have like a design from local um people and areas, so it will be nice and local. Um, and it will say the Richardson Sloan Special Collection Center, um, but it will be completely glassed off and there'll be doors that you would enter into. We'll have lockers for you to put your stuff. We'll um, have pencils available for folks who want to write down things. Um, what else? We'll have a service desk, so there'll always be a staff member when Special Collections is open um, to assist. And Skiggs has, is still wanting to volunteer with us, so we very much appreciate that. And the Scott County, Iowa materials, if they meet the, right now, we I don't really know exactly how much space we will have for everything. So if the Scott County, Iowa Genealogical Library fits into the categories that we've already selected, they'll be moving up with us. And then if we have any additional space, we can reevaluate that in addition. But that does not mean that you'll lose access to any part of the library or the collection. It'll just mean that you might have to wait a couple minutes to while we go fetch the book or the item. Anything I'm missing? Well, some advantages is that there'll be more out in the open and it'll be sunlight. <laughs> There'll still be windows up there. Um, it might be warmer. It might be warmer. Yeah, it will be warmer. 
just quiet because when you come down here, you get the slower. Um, so there'll be there's some computers up there. There'll be at least two computers, is what I saw in the last um yeah. mock up, but we'll see if we can get more. There will be a, a big change, but Right. No, they'll, 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 no, yeah. So there'll be public restrooms, but not in our space where we right. have to deal with them, which will be nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there'll be the two, the the men's and the women's on the second floor, and then there's like a a unisex bathroom now. So, which will be nice because sometimes that's a problem. Yeah. Okay. Hope we can move well, the main map case, the map case seven is definitely coming up. And then also we'll try and get all the, most of the Sanborn maps up. But other than that, and those are the map cases that people mostly use anyways. And so they can request them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Anything can be requested. Yeah. But any other questions? Oh, so yeah, so we'll have we'll have a printer and then a coin op for that. And then we'll have at least two type two machines of each of the types of micro or microfilm reader and printer. Um, we'll have the kick scanner, which will take the place of the overhead scanner because the reason why hope the big overhead scanner might not come up is because if we can hook up the kick scanner to the printer, which has been our problem because there's not a good printer to hook it up to in whatever location we've had it, um, it can just send those prints straight to the printer um, and you can get color black and white copies. Yeah, yeah. Well, whatever the printer will be able to print. So, um, so yeah, it'll be fun. Anything else, you guys? I know it's going to be lots of changes, and it'll be fine. It'll we'll be we'll make it through, and we'll have each other, right? Yeah. But if you guys do come up with any other questions about anything that I presented here, or questions about um, fun projects that you have in mind, or ideas for things, or donations that you're interested in or a contact name for someone who has a donation, um, you can contact us here. My email is there. Um, same as with my department. I will not be here um, probably starting November, early November, maybe late this month um, until next year because I'm going to be having a baby. Um, so if you guys have anything super pertinent, try to Get to me now or next year. So um, Lexi, my supervisor, will be supervising the department, but Katie will field any questions. No. No, she has, she'll just be checking in with my staff. So my staff will be running the department. But if there's anything big and major, try and hold off. <laughs> But any questions from at home? I don't think so. Okay. Well, thank you all. Take cookies and coffee and water. Okay.